Welcome to Invest In. I'm delighted to be here with you. As always, my name is Mentor Ate, and I want to thank you for joining today. And I'm obviously honored and delighted to be coming into your homes or wherever you might be. Now, in today's session, we're going to be picking up from where we finished um, from last time. Last time we talked about investing, but more specifically, it was a very practical but a very detailed um, session. We looked into various deals. We looked into particularly um, how anyone could begin their you know, assessment of a real estate or property investment opportunity. We went through the numbers. Um, it may have been very easy for a lot of people to follow, but if you are still very new to the investment um, um, game or investment world, then it may have been a little bit too heavy for you. But I hope for those of you who were part of the previous session, I hope you found something valuable. In today's session, I'm going to do something slightly differently. You're going to forgive me, but I'm going to deviate. Um, I'm going to digress very slightly for a particular reason. I'm going to talk about investing still, but I'm going to talk about investing from a point of view um, that might be a little bit more suitable for a lot of number of people. Now, I started my journey so many years ago. I live in London right now. Um, but when I began my journey to increasing financial understanding and increasing my wisdom, I there were so many things I didn't know. One of the major questions most people have asked me so far, but also one of the questions that I asked myself when I started the journey was, do I buy? A property or do I rent or do I lease and that's what I want to talk about today I want to share both sides and what I believe in my opinion perhaps is the right questions to ask yourself before making that decision you see thinking is the most important activity that we're all capable of doing um, Henry Ford said it's the hardest work that is out there I found for so many years I wasn't thinking. Now that might sound as a surprise for so many people. You cannot confuse and you shouldn't confuse mental activity with thinking. Thinking is simply the process of asking yourself questions. Because the quality of your life always depends on the quality of questions you ask. If you ask empowering questions, you get empowering answers. If you ask disempowering questions, likewise you get disempowering answers. All of the secrets to life's treasures are hidden in questions. If you ask the right question, the answer comes out. And thinking is simply asking and answering questions. That's the best way to describe it. If you're trying to force yourself to think, it's quite difficult. And part of the reason is because we haven't been, and we weren't trained um, in schools on how to think. But I started asking myself questions, myself questions and I found that the answers I, I got help me make the right decision. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, if you've found yourself perhaps where I used to be so many years ago, you're about to make such a huge decision about should you buy or should you continue renting or leasing? There are two sides of every coin. I always say this. Um, and I believe that more than anything, any person giving advice needs to come from a place of sincerity. But you can be sincere, but also wrong. But also we have to tell the truth. Now, as someone who is into property investing, obviously, of course, I would rather have people rent, obviously, because I have an interest in it. However, my decision and that viewpoint is, is not objective. Every coin comes with three sides you have the heads you have the tail but you also have the edge anyone who says it's better to rent is perhaps only dealing with one side of the coin you're dealing with perspective what you can see um, the way we see the the world and life is always based on where we are what we look towards if you were to stand on the other side of per someone who believes you should buy then likewise all you can talk about is what you believe are the advantages i believe personally that you should be 
comfortable with standing on the edge because when you stand on the edge you can look at both sides and then you can make the right decision for yourself. Intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. And so to analyze whether it's better to lease or better to rent, we have to stand on the edge. As a matter of fact, if you've ever been in a debating society or in a debating team, one of the things that you may have come across is that the person in charge of that team never tells the team members what side they're going to be arguing for or against. You're provided with a topic and you're asked to study the topic and then you're asked to choose or rather you're assigned one side. Those who make the best debaters and those who are the best decision makers are those who can hold both ideas simultaneously, argue for and argue against. I mean, I found in investing, you have to have the ability to ask yourself opposing questions, conflicting questions, because the quality of the questions you ask determines the decisions you make and your decisions determine your outcomes. So in every investment opportunity, one of the most important things you have to do is ask yourself the simple question, what could go wrong? What could go right? In this case, we're asking, could, should we lease or should we buy? Um, I want to take you through that journey. But before I go into that journey, let's start with a diagram. I think this diagram perhaps will give you an idea about a better understanding. Um, there's always something you don't know. I find that to be very, very empowering, but also very humbling. Uh, empowering from the point of view that I believe that if there's something I don't know, then it means there's an answer out there. But humbling from the point of view that if there's something I don't know, then it's possible that I'm making the wrong decisions or perhaps I've excluded some vital piece of information. I think both sides keep me grounded. This is a diagram of what we call of financial statements. Four sections. You have what we call income, you have expense, you have liabilities and you have assets. In making a decision when it comes to financial um, choices, you always have to go back to the basics. And I found most people don't understand the basics. I never understood the basics for so many years and so I made a lot of mistakes. You see, wealth and investing is a game. Whether you like that definition or reference, um, I think that's a personal opinion. I'll let you deal with that. But one of the things I want to say is this. Every game has rules. If you understand the rules, then you can play the game to win. Most people, I did that for so many years. I didn't understand the rules of the game. So I played for so many hours, so many years, and there was no evidence to whether I was succeeding. But I knew from the results I was getting that I was losing. And Winston Churchill said, no matter how beautiful your strategy is, you should occasionally look at the results. The scoreboard is there for a reason. It's there to remind you of how well you're playing, the results. And so, to understand the rules of the game, you've got to understand the vocabulary of the game. Because every single area of life has a vocabulary. Business has a vocabulary. Investing has a vocabulary. Um, even in relationships, intimacy, you've got to learn a few things. There's some things you have to learn. Um, you come to health, there's a vocabulary um, to health. Even creating wealth. And so one of the things I definitely always say to people is, if you want to be successful, study success. If you want to be wealthy, study wealth. If health is your choice of study, then study health. If happiness is your choice of study, then study happiness. Because life has to be a study first. Then it becomes a practice. Then it becomes a habit. Then it becomes a lifestyle. But it begins with a study. So, 
we have to start with this diagram to understand the words because vocabulary simply means words. If you understand the words, it's very easy to understand what you should do or what you shouldn't do. Um, in engineering, coming back to science, there were various laws. The law of thermodynamics, um, first, second and third. And whilst I studied at the young age, there was always something my lecturers would always say. Go back to first principles. Forget about how complicated the equation might be or the question that you're trying to solve might be. If you go back to first principles and come back with the first principles in mind, it's easy to understand what to do. Now, income section of your financial statement simply means money comes in to you. Expense means money goes away from you. Liabilities means you have something that appreciates in value. In some cases, it depreciates in value. In most cases, I should say. Um, in some cases, it appreciates. In most cases, it depreciates. But a liability is also something that necessitates um, and causes an expense. So in addition to costing you an initial capital, it also causes money to move away from you every month. An asset is something that once purchased after the original capital investment appreciates in value, but it creates, in most cases, an income. There are some assets that do not create an income, but most assets that create or lead to wealth should be those that create an income. So, one of the key things to remember is this. There are two sides of a financial statement. This is what I've just drawn. On the right side, this is what leads to poverty. This is what leads to wealth. In other words, if you want to be wealthy, maximize your assets and maximize assets that create an income flow. Because if you're on the other side, which is the poverty side, if you buy personal liabilities or debts, this will cause money to flow away from you through an expense to someone else. So to buy or lease or rent, we've got to come back to this question and ask the simple, fundamental question. Where does buying and where does leasing fall into? Because everything is an investment. Time is an investment. Um, your thoughts are investments. Your money is an investment. The difference is, if you're renting, if you're leasing, Money is flown away from you with no possibility of return. If you're buying, money is flowing away from you. In some cases, depending on whether it's a liability or an asset, money could come back or money could never come back. So it's all subjective. It depends on what you're really doing. So here is the best way to deal with the buying and the, or the renting or the leasing. Here are some of my thoughts. Remember, this is a subjective view. I'll do my best to present both sides, using myself as an example, using my life um, and the decisions I've made, but it's subjective. Um, study other opinions and find out what other people think. Then make the decision based on what you think is right for you. Don't just accept every one person's opinion. No one has all the answers. And I don't consider myself to be an exception, but I think what I'll share with you will be quite interesting. Or rather, I hope you find it interesting and I'll let you decide. Most people say you should rent, so let's deal with that. Rent. Some say you should buy. So here are my thoughts in, in kind of arguing both sides. If you're renting, the advantages you might come up with is I'm free. I'm not tied down to a particular location geographically. I completely agree with that. So there is the idea about freedom. Most people who are renting are not committed. Um, there's a saying that um, if one is not committed, there is hesitancy. The, the, the possibility of withdrawing or drawing back. Once you haven't committed, you have options. You can always decide I have a job off of us coming from a different city, I can move, I'm free. I'm like a bird, I can fly. That is the opinion I had so many years ago. I felt 
I didn't want to commit to a long-term 30-year mortgage um, that would tie me down to a particular place. And the truth of real estate is simply that it's um, it's illiquid. You can't just sell in, the next, in 24 hours and move. There's a process, there's a time lag. Um, and for that reason, yes, there is some restrictions in flexibility and the options it provides. If you rent also, it gives you that ability, I would say the almost the freedom to choose where you live. You can choose a, a location next to the, the seaside. You can choose a location right in the middle of the city center. You can choose a location right next to your place of work. So I would say flexibility in choice of location. Now, as from an individual point of view, maybe there are one or two others you can think about in terms of renting, but I'd like to stop there. And I don't want to move down to what people should be thinking about. If you're going to rent, remember this. There are two ways of making money. You work for money. In other words, you invest time for money. You're the slave, money is the master, because you're working for it. That option has no leverage. The second way of working, of earning money, is have money work for you. You're the master, money is the slave. You use leverage sources, um, and you can generate money whilst you even sleep by using leveraged activities without you having to invest your own time yourself. You can use other people's time, experience, knowledge, and understanding. In understanding both sides, what that means is if you have a job and you earn, when you've earned, you have to pay for what you're renting from what we will call your post-tax salary. So after you've paid your taxes, then what's left is yours and you pay for your rent from that part. Most people who recommend that you rent, they do one of two things. They never really tell you how they generate their income, but also how they pay for the rent. So here is what I want to share with you. If you have a business, a business gets to pay all of their expenses before they pay for taxes. That's the difference between a business and an individual. And that's the reason why entrepreneurs or business owners have a much higher ability, especially depending on where you live. If you live in the Western world, where there is a high rate of taxation, the highest expense normally is your taxes. But if you have a business, on the other hand, what you find normally, um, the tax laws are written to support business owners because they create jobs and provide opportunities that the government cannot provide themselves. So one of the things they do is they incentivize business owners and they say, for example, you can pay for all of your expenses. When you're done paying all of your expenses, then you can pay for your taxes. So for some business owners who have financial understanding and good advisors, they end up paying nothing because by the time they paid all their expenses, they have nothing, they have little or nothing left to pay, so they don't pay taxes. You as an individual, however, you must pay taxes first, then you pay for your rent. So someone who has a business can pay for their rent through the company. So for them, it's a lot better because it's a company expense. They're not paying for it themselves. Um, so what I might say is if, if you have a business, this might be a good option. But also number four is this. When I drew the, the, the diagram of the financial statements, income, expense, liabilities, assets, one of the key things that wealthy people do is they buy assets first and then have the assets pay for their liabilities. So I'll give you a good example. Let's say, for example, you, you see a very beautiful car you want. You want to buy the car. You have the money to buy the car. The average person will pay for the car. The financially intelligent person, on the other hand, will not pay for the car directly because they understand that a car is a liability and it depreciates in value. For example, you walk into a showroom and buy a car, drive it out, drive it back in two minutes and it's lost about 25% of its value. 
So it's a liability, but it causes an expense every month because you have to maintain, pay taxes, pay maintenance, pay utility costs, um, and so. So it's a liability. So some of the financially intelligent will always lean towards buying an asset first and having the assets generate income that pays for the liability. So some people argue about leasing a car really is no different from renting because what you can do is if you have an asset, that asset can now pay for your liability. So if you're renting on the basis that you have an asset paying for the rent, then the renting in itself, obviously you're getting it for free because you have an asset that's paying for it. But you can do that really well from a business point of view if you have a business because you have all the leverage advantages. You can use debt, you can use taxes. For someone who is an individual, your options are limited. Now let's talk about the buying side. If you focus on buying, not only does it give you freedom, but it gives you the opportunity to increase your, your wealth. But more importantly, it helps you increase what we call your net worth. Because when you buy, especially if you bought intelligently and you bought with some level of wisdom, what you find is the more you pay down your mortgage, if it's paid out well, and I'll show you how to do that in a short while, what you find is that you start slowly increasing the equity you have in the property, but also there's something called passive and active appreciation. A house or a home, in this instance, that's what we're dealing with. We're not talking about investment properties, not yet. We're talking about a home. A home is a liability. It's not a, an asset. It's a liability because every month is going to cause money to flow away from you. However, it's a good liability. In other words, there is something called good and there is something called bad liability. If I went into a showroom and I bought an Aston Martin DB9, for example, that's a bad liability because it depreciates in value and it causes an expense. If you buy a home, on the other hand, using wisdom with sound financial principles, having done your research, great location, great financing, what you find it's a liability, it causes money to flow away from you, but it appreciates in value over time. So we call that a good liability. So by buying, what you're doing is you're, you're putting some money into your own financial future. And I'll talk about that in more detail. But also when you start buying a property, it gives you that option now to start using what I call the game of the wealthy, the opportunity to use debt, but more importantly, the opportunity to take advantage of taxes. Um, and I'll share how that works in a short while. So for me personally, I would say as a, someone who invests in property, obviously I want people to rent because that helps my business. But put that to one side and let's be frank and let's be honest. There is an advantage of renting. I will question it. And I'll show you why I question it. I'm using real life examples of numbers. I can show you what you're really losing by renting long term. But if you're buying, there are also some disadvantages. For example, most people buy. And when you buy, remember this, Investing is an intellectual game. Um, an intellectual game simply means that your decisions should be made using, made using wisdom, made using sound financial principles. But more importantly, investing and creating wealth, in my opinion, is boring. In my opinion. Um, there's nothing exciting about it. The results you, get, you gain maybe makes you feel excited, the, the, your, your progress and you learning and your personal development and you becoming that person de deserving of the dream and the goal, it's exciting. But in terms of the activity and what you do is boring. Why? Because when you're investing as a good investor, you have to eliminate all forms of emotions. It's an intellectual game. You think using experience and wisdom, sound principles, and you eliminate all emotion. Now, if you eliminate all emotion, then you're 
You've taken out all the excitement from the experience because you're simply dealing with numbers. Does it work? Is there good financing? Is it a good location? What's the return? It's very, very emotionless, but that's what you need to be a good investor. The problem with buying a home is because it's not an investment and more importantly, because it's a place that most people will live in, it can be emotionally draining. And by draining, I'm not saying it's difficult, I'm simply saying once people buy, their homes then become their highest source of expense. Not based on what they're paying for the mortgage, if we were to assume both the mortgage amount and the rent amount were the same, most people start to spend much more. Now you want to buy new curtains and change the rugs and change the sofas and, and do this. And all of that you may not have done if you were renting. So by buying, what you find is that you start getting into debt. And I find most people who buy a home suddenly start digging themselves into personal debt. Personal debt. So I would say if you buy, there's a, a likelihood of getting into personal debt because there are a few things you start doing. And I've seen people who, they get a mortgage and then they get a bigger mortgage because they want to do what we call home improvements. And the more they do the home improvements, the more they lock themselves down into this particular location where there's so much in debt, they can't move, they can't sell. Because in most cases, let's be honest, many people who fall in love with a home they buy get so emotionally attached to the point where they spend more on the house to the point where, although it looks great, um, the value of the house is less than what they've actually spent. Now, to the individual, obviously, it's it's a personal decision. But once you're emotionally involved, you're, you're doing things to the house to the point where all of what you've done, whilst it's nice, it doesn't really increase actively the value of the property. It might do to an extent, but you get to a point where you have spent much more than the property is really worth um, in most cases to the buyer because the seller decides the price of the transaction if you're going to buy and sell the buyer decides the terms upon which and if the transaction moves forward but the final thing i'll talk about in the relation to buying is it limits your options in terms of flex so it's inflexible it's inflexible because it means now you've bought and I've met so many people who after buying a property they were done they were done opportunities came from various places but they couldn't accept the opportunities because subconsciously they felt they had to be in the home which is kind of sad because you can always sell it you can rent it out and move but emotionally they were involved and Opportunity comes to everyone every day, but they come in strange ways. Many people don't see them because of a lack of awareness, but also because of our commitments to things we have. Now, I started today's session by trying to just address both, just to prove to you that I have no particular um, desire to either guide you towards one part or the other. I'll let you decide at the end of today's session whether you want to rent or whether you want to buy. But what I want to do next is um, show you the numbers and perhaps equip you with enough information to help you make the right choices and the right decisions. The average um, one bedroom flat in London is roughly about a thousand one hundred it's slightly more than this is probably about a thousand two hundred on average in london today um, in some locations it's much more than that obviously but let me use a thousand one hundred because i'm going back a number of years um, when i started my journey for most people and i know so many friends and i know so many um, friends of friends who live in london but also who live in other cities and they've been renting for a long time I know someone who has been renting for 10 years. Now I rented for a number of years until I started to see the advantages of both options and also the disadvantages of both options. Let's assume that you live 
in the city. In this example, we're using London and you're paying 1,100. Let's also assume for most people, the average um, salary in London is about 2,000 pounds per month, net. And by net, I'm talking about after all deductions are taken out in relation to taxes. So 24,000 pounds per year, net. I'm talking about average. Um, you've paid all your taxes, 24,000 pounds left. Now, 24,000 pounds will be probably in the region of about 28,000 um, pounds gross. If you're paying 1,500 pounds, then it means that you're paying You're paying about 55% of your net income towards rent. Now, automatically, in relation to financial intelligence, this means it's too much. You should normally not be spending more than 35% on either your mortgage or your rent. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because of a principle. The principle is a, a defined principle for creating wealth this is the principle this is the formula for wealth wealthy people earn when they earn the first thing they do is they invest and once they're done investing they spend the principle simply says pay yourself first pay yourself first um, when you've earned before you go buying all of your necessities and your desires and your luxury items, set aside a portion of what you've earned for investing for your future. Then you can spend the rest. Just like a farmer who um, cultivates a harvest, takes a portion of the seeds from the harvest, puts that portion back into the soil for the next season. You can't eat all the seed. The seed corn um, must be split into two parts. The part for consumption and the part for reproduction. So the principle of wealth is simply a part of what you earn is for you. Set it aside to pay yourself to invest. Now this simply means if you invest first, then you automatically would have to live on a budget. Um, a budget is simply a plan to help you achieve your dreams of financial freedom or financial prosperity. The ancient Babylonians said that this should be no more than 10%. In my various teaching seminars or sessions, if you've listened to them or if you've read my book, Unstoppable, I make a recommendation. I have something that I call a 65-35 plan. I say this is the formula for wealth. You should always focus on living within 65% of what you earn net. Never spend more than 65% because you will be investing 35%. The 35% is meant to be 10% for active investing, 10% for passive investing, 10% for charitable giving 5% to invest in yourself. Just like the farmer sets aside a seed, everything you've created today in your life is a result of your mind. So if you want to have more, you have to be more. But if you want to be more, you have to invest in yourself. So I recommend 5% to invest in your personal development and growth. Now, this simply means 65% is the maximum you can spend. If you're spending 55% just on housing, it means that you cannot survive. It means you will have to rob the 35% to be able to survive. Meaning that you can't even set aside money to invest. That's the reason we talk about 35%. Now, I digressed for a little bit and I'm sorry about that, but let me bring you back to what we 
are trying to analyze what we're trying to spend more time addressing. If you, if you have a, a rental contract, a lease agreement of a thousand pounds and 100 every month, if you rent for 10 years, at the end of 10 years, you would have spent 132,000 pounds on rent. How do I arrive at that number? It's simply 1,100 times 12, which is 1,320, 0, 13,200 times 10 years. That gives 132,000 pounds. This is what you would have paid. Now let's go back and let's perhaps for remembrance sake, let's put this diagram here still. Income, expense, liabilities, assets. By renting, that's a liability because it's causing money to flow away from you as an expense to someone else. At the end of 10 years, you've paid someone else 132,000 pounds. What do you have? You have nothing. Nothing. Now, William Shakespeare said that nothing is either good or bad, but your thinking makes it so. I'll let you decide in a short while which option is better. Nothing is either good or bad. Your thinking makes it so. I'm simply of the view based on the fundamental principles of wealth creation, that you want to create assets that pay money to you rather than you pay money to someone. But even if you have expenses or liabilities, let, them be, let, it, be, let it be good liabilities, something that in the short term perhaps is an inconvenience, but in the long term, um, it reverses its role and then it becomes perhaps a, a, a huge contribution back to your life. 10 years, you've paid every single month, 1,100. And there's so many people I know in London who, that's all they do. Um, I did that for a number of years, but suddenly I started to study, and this is where I began to change my life. Now we're going to assume that if you, we're going to assume in this case that the other option is to buy a home. Let's assume you're going to buy the same one bedroom flat in London. Let's look for the average. Let's say the average one bedroom flat is 350,000. Let's also assume that your mortgage will be based on an agreement between you and the bank. The bank says you have to bring 10% as a deposit and will give you 90%. 10% of 350 is 35,000. 90% of 350 is 315,000. This is the arrangement with the bank. Now this assumes that you have to bring 10%, but there's so many incentives now being offered to people who are first time buyers. You can get a 100% mortgage with whether it's a buy to help or whatever scheme is available, but there are opportunities where you don't have to have 10%. The deal can be done in such a way by you get a 100% mortgage, maybe you have a, a joint equity partner and you pay off the remaining 10% slowly. That's possible. For the, case, for the sake of what we're trying to do today, let's assume, for assumption's sake, let's just assume that 315,000 pounds is what the bank will give you as a loan. Let's also assume that your mortgage payment every month will be 1,100, just like you were renting. So we're not trying to side one, make one more favorable than the other. If you took out a mortgage for 315,000 pounds, most people will take out a loan for 30 years or 35 years. Now, if 
you made a thousand one hundred pounds every month. At the end of 10 years, you would have paid 132,000 pounds, just like you would have paid if you were renting. This is a mortgage. However, the 132,000 pounds at the end of the 10 year period is not yours. Yes, you've made that quantity of amount in terms of payment, but it's not yours. The truth of the matter is, if you were to have taken out a 30 or 35 year loan, what you find is that the loan arrangement, the longer the loan arrangement is, the more it favors the bank. Banks are very clever. The bank has no interest in making you wealthy. They want to make themselves wealthy. So what they do generally is they say, for this loan we're going to have for 315,000 pounds, there's going to be an interest repayment of whatever that might be. So at the end of the 35 or 30 year period, what you find that you're paying between 470 and maybe about 510,000 pounds. For the sake of this assessment, let's use 470 pounds. I think depending on the, the mortgage interest, it might be something closer to 510, 512,000 pounds. But let's use 400 and 70. So this is what you will pay at the end of the 30 years. So this is what we will use. Now, this is the loan amount, 315. The 470 is the loan amount plus interest. So the interest repayment in this case is roughly about 170, 165,000. That's your interest on the loan. The way the bank set up the repayment, the longer it is, the more it favors them. Now the banks understand that most people will move, refinance, remortgage every 10 years or less. So what they do is they set up the repayments in such a way that they want to get back everything they gave you or as much as they can within 10 years. So what they do is ensure that whilst you're repaying, the setup is so strange, but also very sad. You've paid 132,000 pounds in 10 years. Can you guess how much of the 132,000 pounds would have gone towards your principal, 350, and what would have gone towards your interest? Very sad. Most banks sometimes will have it in such a way that in the 10 years, you've only paid 10% towards the principal and 90% has gone towards the interest. Some other banks are a little bit more accommodating. This will be about 80, 20. I've seen banks where it drops down to about 70, 30. I'll be very honest. But assuming 70, 80, 20 percentage, then this means that out of the 132,000 pounds you paid, roughly 80,000 pounds, has gone towards interest and only about 40,000 pounds has gone towards your initial capital. In this case, let's make it more real and say 42,000 pounds has gone towards the original principal. However, um, without, let me, let me keep this so that, so that you can still understand you have 42,000 pounds in 10 years that has gone towards your repaying of the original principal. Now, let me explain what that means. Principal and an interest. I give you 10 pounds. You say to me, well, at the end of the year, you have to pay me my money back with interest of 6%. So it's 6% of 10 pounds. This means that if you've paid 42,000 pounds towards the principal, it means that you now have 42,000 pounds of equity in the property. But also the remaining of 80,000 pounds has then gone towards the principal. So towards the interest, that's for the bank, for them giving you the money, for them loaning you the money. But this is where it gets still very cool and clever. The person who is renting at the end of 10 years 
only has nothing because they've been given the money away. The person who has been setting aside money and paying through a mortgage has 42,000 pounds after 10 years. But that's not all they have because in the 10 year period, the property has appreciated in value. A property of 350,000 um, pounds. Let me take this out to make this a little bit more free so you can understand. A property of 350,000 pounds in a 10 year period in London, it bought smartly, it bought properly, it bought in the lo right location. If the person who bought had studied, not the market, had studied the environment, had studied the demand supply um, relationships between um, renters and buyers and builders, what you find is that the property appreciates in value. Now, there are two forms of property appreciation, passive and active. Passive means you do nothing. Um, it's external to you. Maybe there are fewer properties there, but there's a lot of demand. And that has nothing to do with you being a great investor. It's just a result of demand supply. But also, it could also be a result of perhaps the purchasing power of the currency dropping. Um, or that perhaps there's um, a few other external conditions that are affecting or influencing um, the real estate or property industry. In 10 years, let's assume that for the past five years in the same location or more, that properties have increased by 6%, which is very, 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 very average and expected in London. It means every year the value goes up by 6%. Now I want to show you how by doing nothing to the property, how you can maximize your net worth. Because active appreciation is where you deliberately decide to do some changes to the property. You might decide to repaint, put some new blinds, put some new floor in, uh, maybe put an extension to the flat, change the fixtures and um, fittings and equipment in the apartment. But you do something to increase, but that's true active. I'm not talking about active in this point. at this point. Let's say you do nothing. You want to assess how quickly this property would have increased in value. There are two ways of doing this. I'm going to show you both ways so you can understand and so you can see that um, what I'm sharing with you works. And it's a principle that everyone who understands investing use, uses. There's a principle called the rule of 72. The rule of 72. The rule of 72 simply is a, it's a, a shortcut to the compounding principle. It simply says, if you want to find out how quickly your va the value of your investment would double, take 72 and divide it by the interests. So let's say in this case, 6%. So in 12 years, this property that was 350 will become 700,000 pounds. That's a rule of 72, very simple. In addition to this, if we were to put this aside and say, well, I, I don't really believe in the rule of 72. I want to know, you know, based on previous statistics, what would have, what would the property appreciate to at 6%, it means after year one, I'm going to use a calculator so you can see that uh, this is a very simple process that anyone can do. 350,000 pounds after year one would mean that your property is 371,000. Year two, 393.2 by year 4 441.8 by year 5 
9, 591.3, and then 10, 626,000 pounds. But just to prove to you that we're not far off, if we go to number 8, number 11, year number 11, year 11, 664, 4, by year 12, we have 678,000. So you can see that a root of 72, it gives you a good estimate of what and how quickly the value for property will double in value. So we're not far off. After 10 years, the property is now worth 626,000. Let's say for the sake of argument, Let's round it up to 600,000. Keep things relatively rounded. 600,000 pounds, that's the new value. So, this has become 600, but you had an original loan amount for 315. So, what you have in the property now is 285. 285,000. Now, I might make some mistakes with the numbers, but I want you to follow the principle itself. Don't really get too bogged down on whether there's a decimal point missing or perhaps whether there's an error of one or two. I want you to get the, the basic principle of philosophy. 285,000 pounds. However, in the 10 year period, you've paid 132, of which 80,000 was for the bank and 42,000 was for your equity. So 42,000 pounds here means you have increased your net worth by 327,000 pounds, more than a quarter of a million in 10 years. The person who was renting has nothing. You have 327,000. Now let that do the numbers for you. There's always a story behind numbers. The numbers never lie. Now this shows you that if you decided to buy, but if you bought smartly and if you bought intelligently, then you could very easily increase your net worth much quicker than someone who has been renting all their life for the last 10 years. Most people would say this is still equity in a house and you can't use the money. Of course you can, absolutely. And this is where the advantages of the wealthy come in. The bank has a system. The system with the banks are based on the principle that they want to make profit. So the bank will say to you, we can give you money based on the value of appreciation in your property. The principle they use is they say, we'll give you 75% of the difference between your new value less your original loan. The original loan was 315. The new value is 600 times 75%. So what we're dealing with here is 275 times 75. So the bank will be willing to give you 206,000 pounds as a result of the appreciated value. So here is the point. You have a choice. But let's say for sake of argument, you don't believe that it would have appreciated that much. I don't see a reason why it wouldn't. I've seen it happen in so many opportunities and so many transactions. But let's just assume that that's unrealistic and all you had was 50%, okay? 50% of this would have been 140 to 50, meaning that your value of your prop 
your equity in the property would be 184,500. 184 still again zero is a no-brainer. But also let's say the bank could only give you half this amount. So they could only give you 103,000 pounds. You can pull out 103,000 pounds. Here's the point. That 103,000 pounds can now be used as C capital for your next investment. Because you're now investing beyond your original starting position is no longer your home, it's now an investment. The ratio of what you have to put forward as a deposit to the loan will vary. The bank might say it has to be 75, 25. We'll give you 75, you bring up 25%. Now you might be good and you find a good deal where you say, Mr. Bangor found a new property for 500,000 pounds and I can bring up 100,000 pounds, 20%. The bank could agree to that. You go through the same process I've just explained, but in this case, let's say you do your numbers well, you manage the property well, you find the tenants, you get good financing, um, because in many cases, it's not about revenue, it's about profit. It's not how much you're generating, it's how much you're keeping. Let's say you use good sound principles of investing and you're generating 400 pounds net from this new investment, which is an investment, is an asset now because someone else is paying for the loan, paying your debts and giving you 400 pounds every month. Now, what you can do is take this 400 pounds and assign that towards paying off your mortgage. So you're now paying only 600 pounds. So what you have now is an arrangement whereby your asset is paying down for some of your liability, which is what I explained at the early start. Now, this is a perfect arrangement. However, here is my recommendation. One of the most important parts and keys to invest in is this. Um, you've got to know the rules. Um, you've got to understand the rules and obey the rules. Let me share what those rules are and how you can use it to your advantage. Number one, pay yourself first. In other words, invest. Set aside a portion of what you earn and invest. Number two, when you've invested, put it in a great investment vehicle using sound financial principles and using and following the counsel of people who have succeeded in that area. So follow proven principles. Number three, when you start investing, you will begin to generate income, dividends, interest. The most important thing you should do is never spend it. Never spend it. Reinvest it. So reinvest your returns. There's so many I can go to, but I want to stop here and explain this so you can see how powerful this is. I've demonstrated so far that it would seem, based on the numbers, that if you were buying, if you bought smartly, then it could be potentially a better investment. But I said something at the start that most people who get into um, personal debts through a home end up having a, a very big mortgage because they keep refinancing to get more into debts and Unfortunately, what you end up having is the 1,100 would have, which would have been all you paid if you were renting, suddenly it becomes 1,500 for someone who has a mortgage because now they want more furniture, they take out a home equity loan, they keep increasing and then they refinance. It's a nightmare. But if we assume that you were disciplined and all you paid was the 1,100, I want to take you a step further. Um, I think this is important. But I want to take you a step further. Let's assume at this point that we've concluded the discussion about should I rent or should I buy. Um, so I can take you a little bit deeper and talk about perhaps some tricks. They're not really tricks, they're strategies. They're, they're really what I'll call wisdom principles to making sure that you succeed if you're buying 
as, a, as a, an individual buying a home. They're principles you must follow. But let's conclude this section of the rental, buy or lease discussion. And I'll stop by saying this. If you're renting right now, ask yourself a simple question. If I continue to pay what I'm paying for the next 10 years, at the end of 10 years, what would I have? Now, the best way of analyzing that, because for so many people, some people say, I'm renting because I want to save so I can buy. The problem is if you go back to the 65-35 principle I mentioned previously, unfortunately for so many people, because of how much they spend on rent, very few are saving more than or setting aside more than 5% to invest. Meaning they have to save for the long term before they can even begin the investment journey. So here is my recommendation. Consider buying, if you can, because it's an investment. Now, part of the reason I said consider buying is this. You have to understand the purpose of money. Money has a purpose, it has a function. Money is not there to be spent. The purpose of money is to position it in a way that it multiplies itself, where it's working for you. But if you cannot multiply it in the form of currency or money, then you must push that money into what we call an asset that can maintain the value of the money over time. That's the key. If you have £10,000 right now and you held onto that £10,000, by the end of the year, say after 12 months, the purchasing power of that £10,000 would have declined. In London today, the inflation rate is 2.9%. Let's just approximate it to 3% for sake of calculation. Applying the rule of 72 means if you want to calculate how quickly your money could decline in value, reduce by half its value, if you divide 72 by 3, you're talking about 24 months. Now, technically, it doesn't mean that in 24 months exactly that your money would depreciate and the reason is simply because inflation varies it fluctuates it was 2% in 2008 it's increased to 2.9% it might decline again but in 2008 it would have meant that it would have taken 36 months for the money to decline by half its value it purchasing power that's what I'm talking about purchasing power so one of the most important things you should understand is this let's pretend and let's assume the person renting has good intentions. And most people that I know have good intentions. They're probably renting because they want to save so that they can invest. Here is the problem. Saving is an obsolete way to create wealth. If you're saving money, you're getting poor. I'll say that again. Saving is an obsolete way to create wealth. If you save, you increase your wealth incrementally. If you invest, you increase your wealth exponentially. Two separate paths to creating wealth. Saving is obsolete. You don't save actively, you save passively. By active, I'm talking about for the long term. If you're saving for more than 12 months, I call that active saving because your money is declining in value. Now, even if you're saving in the bank, most banks, my bank pays 0.25%. It's almost zero. Inflation is 2.9. So, Except the bank is paying you something greater than 3%, you're losing. Every single month, you're losing money. So here is my view, because most people say, well, if the bank wants a deposit, I can't afford it. Here is my recommendation. If you buy smartly, just watch this for example. Just, just analyze this. I think this is important for someone, so I'm going to share this. Let's assume the property was 315k and you needed 35,000. Let's assume that you got a mortgage and the mortgage was based on a, a two year fixed period. They say for the first two years you might pay one point, let's say 1.49%, and then after the two years it goes up to 4.99%. 
it means for the first two years you can't do anything but let's assume that this property goes up by six percent in value after the first year the property that you have that is three hundred and fifteen thousand pounds by passive appreciation has nothing to do with you making changes you haven't invested in anything the property is now worth three hundred and thirty three nine hundred by the end of the second year the property is now worth three hundred and fifty three point nine can you see the magic by the end of the second year when the first fixed period comes to the end at the end of the two-year period the appreciation you've had in two years is more than the original value of the property the original value of the property was 350 this was the loan this was your deposit so, the bank will be willing, now watch this carefully, the numbers might not be exactly accurate, but just watch this. The bank will be willing to give you 35, assuming, let's, let's round this up, this is 35, 3.9, let's, let's just make it simple, let's just call it 355, so that it's a round number. Um, the bank will be willing to give you normally 75% of the difference between the new loan, the new value, and the original loan. So 355 less 315. However, it's not going to be 315 because that was the original loan amount. In two years, you've made some payment towards that amount. Let's look into this. Let's say you've paid a uh, 1100 in 12 months you've paid 1 3 13200 in 2 years you've paid 26400 however remember what i said to you we were using an 80 20 principle 80% would have gone towards the interest 20% would have been yours so 20% of 264 26400 is 5280 that's okay. So this 5,280 will be deducted from this, this 315. For sake of keeping it simple, let's call it 5,000. After all, I rounded this up to 355. So let's call it 5,000. 5,000 less this 350 means that the bank will be willing to give you the difference between 355 and 310. So let's look at that. 45,000 pounds. 45,000 pounds times 0 0.75. 33,000 pounds and 700. You needed 35,000 pounds as a deposit. For many people who say, I can't get the money, you can. You might go to family members, you might go to a friend and say, I want you to loan me 35,000 pounds. I'm using it for something intelligent, I'm using it for something smart. And in two years, I'll give it back to you. So what I'm trying to share here is, you don't need the deposit, it doesn't have to come from you. You've got to learn how to use leverage, learn how to use other people's money. Someone might be, think about this, someone might have 35,000 pounds sitting in a bank account, but they're only getting 0.025%. If you offer them anything better than inflation rate, they would accept it. Let's assume it's 5% you offer them. It means that you can raise that capital, get a deposit. At the end of the two years, you've done nothing. You can pull out enough. In many cases, the bank will be willing to give you a little bit more than 75%. If you demonstrate that it will continue to appreciate in value and you have a good financial statement, you can now pay off the original deposit so you now have your house. You don't have any money owed to other investors. All you have to now do is pay towards your mortgage. I explained this simply to make a point. You've got to learn that people who create wealth and investors understand the philosophy of life. 
create and collaborate. Most people are trying to compete. You're trying to do everything on your own. Now you might say, I don't have anyone who will loan me that amount. Fine, if you can't get a loan, no problem. The question is, can you find two people or one person who can go into business with you? This is a business. This is simply dealing with business. Now, let's assume that this is all feasible. Then what you find is in, in 10 years, one person has nothing. But you, by smartly making a decision to buy, but also by disciplining yourself not to go crazy and get into debt, by staying flexible, you could appreciate and increase your net worth. And here's the most important point I'm going to make. If you want to create wealth, you have two, two pathways. You can do it as an individual, you can do it as a business. Someone who has been paying rent to a bank, all they can show is income coming in and income going out. Someone who owns can demonstrate to a bank income coming in. Part of that income is smartly going into, in this case, an investment, though liability, and is appreciating in value. So you can demonstrate to the bank that your net worth is increasing. And you can demonstrate consistency in your credit that you've managed, you've maintained um, your accounts. So it's, this is some of the things to think about. I'll let you decide which is better for you. What I wanted to do now is to go very quickly over a recommendation. In case you fall within the group that might consider buying or already have bought, there's a strategy. If you want to maximize the decision you've made to buy instead of rent, I want to show you something that's going to blow your mind, completely blow your mind away. Completely blow your mind away. The average individual, when they buy a home, I did this. So trust me, I'm speaking from, I'm not speaking out of term, I'm speaking from experience. I started by going for a 30 year loan. Now, I make reference to the fact that the longer the duration, the more it favors the bank. If you're going to take out a personal mortgage, whatever you do, whatever you do, never take out a 30-year loan. Never. As soon as I started to increase my understanding, one of the things I did very quickly was go back to the bank and ask the bank to change the terms. Never go for a 30 year loan. You're better off going for a 10 year or 15 year loan. If you go for a 10 or 15 year loan, you can pay off just by making a slight change in what you pay every month. You can pay off, or rather you can save what you would have paid in interest. Now, previously in the example, I gave you 315 as the loan amount, and I gave you 165 as the interest. By making a subtle change, so the bank may have said it's a thousand one hundred pounds for your mortgage. By asking for a ten or fifteen year loan, you save in many cases more than one hundred and sixty five thousand pounds of what you would have paid in interest. So you can pay off this total property in ten fifteen years, and you're debt free. But there's another catch. If you decided to go for a 10 or a 15 year loan, you're still under the terms of the bank. In other words, you're still paying principal and interest. The bank might say, yes, we can give it to you, but you have to pay 1500 pounds, for example, per month for a 15 year loan. For example, out of this 1500, you're paying principal and interest. Yes, you're paying a little bit more principal, but the interest is calculated based on the principal left. So you will pay off this loan much longer. Here is the strategy that I use, and this is what I recommend. Let's assume you, you are capable 
of paying an extra 400 pounds per month. Let's just assume. Better still, now let's keep this 400, that you can pay an extra 400 pounds per month. Let's assume perhaps that you've disciplined yourself to follow the 35% and 65% rule. You're not spending more than 65%. Or maybe let's just say you have an extra 10% you're setting aside for investing. But let's assume that you can pay an extra 400 pounds. Rather than go to the bank and change the rate, the terms, to 15 years, what you do is you go to the bank and agree that you want to make an extra payment per month. Most banks accept that. They will normally allow you to pay um, up to 10% of the balance left on the account. So you can say to the bank that you're going to pay £400 extra per month. But that £400 goes to the principal only. Remember, if you do it this way, the bank, they do some really funny calculations because they're trying to maximize their return. This means the bank, in this case, depending on the arrangement, because once you change the terms, what they might decide is rather than this be 80-20 or rather than it be 70-30 in terms of principal um, or rather in terms of what goes towards the interest and what goes towards the principal, they might even decide to make it 90-10 so that they can get a lot more of their interest back. If you go down this option of changing the rate, the term period, they might change this ratio so that you end up paying a little bit more. If you follow this approach I'm suggesting on the other hand, if you were already on an 80-20, what it simply means, this formula goes towards the principal and just this subtle change alone by making that you can pay off your entire mortgage within seven and a half years, between seven and probably nine years. Now here's the catch. Let's round this up and call this 10 years. In 10 years, what would have taken you 30 years to pay off? You paid off your entire mortgage in 10 years. Now watch this. Person number one, person number two. I made reference to the fact in the earlier example that you could pull out your original increase in value from the property and buy another property. And I said that that property could be such that it's paying off all of the debts, but it creates a net income of 400 pounds. And what I've been showing so far is rather than have that 400 pounds spent, rather than even having that 400 pounds um, allocated towards changing your, your home mortgage terms from 30 to 50, and I'm saying reinvest that 400 pounds into your home. And that will reduce it down to between seven and a half and 10 years. Now watch this. The challenge for most people and where most people probably fail is they spend the 400 pounds because they think we've earned it. We have all the bills, let's, let's go on vacation, so they spend it. Most people will continue to pay 100 pounds, 1100 pounds per month, and they do this for 30 years. And guess what? On the assumption that they don't refinance and they don't move at the end of the 30 year period, they would have paid off the property at the end of the 30 years. If the second person on the other hand used some wise financial principle of putting back that 400, they would have paid this out. We say, let's just assume 10 years. So at the end of 10 years, they have the property owned, no mortgage, debt free. But also, what they then do is take that 1,500 pounds they were paying towards the mortgage. If you put that in an interest account or an investment that pays 10% return every year, in 20 years, you will have approximately 2.1 to 2.4 million. 
So by the time he gets to the end of the 30 year period, this person has nothing else apart from the value of the property, which you also have. You, on the other hand, you have the value of the property and you have about 2.4 million extra. Guess what? That 2.4 million, if put in an investment that paid 10% to protect the principal, this 2.4 million will pay you 240,000 pounds per month. And your original 2.4 million stays secure. Can you see how wealth is created? It's just, you know, buying a house is not just about thinking about the house. You've got to think long term. You've got to think about, okay, what could this become? Now, watch this. If for some reason you decided to leave that investment instead of for 20 years, you left that for 40 years. In 40 years, this investment that started as something really small, you would have more than 9.5 million. So by the time it's time for you to retire, you're multi-millionaire. All because you paid off your debt on time. The average person, in most cases, once they get to the 10 year period, they refinance, they get a bigger debt. So, in the end of 40 years, some people are still paying off their debt. If you were disciplined, and that's the big word, discipline, at the end of 40 years, you have a home, clear and free, but also you have up to 10 million pounds as a result of smart investing. So what I'm trying to share here is this, it doesn't really matter whether you lease, it doesn't matter whether you rent, it doesn't matter whether you own. The question is, what are your outcomes? What do you really want? What is it you're hoping to get? If it's wealth, if it's financial freedom, then your decision has to be based on sound financial principles. Now, I hope that's been useful. Uh, that's all I'm going to cover for today. Allow me to wish you the best of luck if you um, find yourself in the dilemma of choosing what to do. I would also recommend you do something. Go study, find out what other people are saying, learn for yourself. Um, knowledge is important. Wisdom is more important. So reach out to other people and learn from other people's experiences and, and gather all the information and then select what you think is right for you. Um, the best decisions you make are usually decisions you make based on wisdom. So you have to invest first in yourself to see the value of what I've shared, but more importantly, to know whether it's right for you. Anyone can give you advice. Advice is freely given. I love what Shakespeare said. He said, um, I'm going to paraphrase it here now. He said, he said, if I can, he said, I can teach 20 people you know, he said it's easier for me to teach 20 people to do um, or right, to know what I know. In other words, I'm, I can get 20 people to perhaps understand what I'm sharing in terms of teaching and knowledge. But it's a lot more difficult for me to get one person out of the 20 to do what I'm telling them to do. So the doing is much, much harder than the knowing. A lot of this is knowledge. The question is wisdom, can you apply it? So what I would suggest is study other people, find out what's out there. I can give you the best ideas based on my experiences, but these are based on my experiences. They might be good advice, but not right for you. You've got to distinguish the difference. All good advice is not right for you. So make a decision based on who you are right now, where you want to get to, your dreams, your vision, um, and then be selective. Don't be ashamed and never be afraid to reject advice. Advice is freely given, but let it be advice that is right for you. I wish you the best of luck. God bless.